Merry Christmas. I've got one last present for you. It's a final episode of Young Heretics. First things first, if you are hearing this after the 25th of December, please be reminded, if you haven't seen our previous Christmas episodes, that Christmas is 12 days long. I'm going to die on this hill if I have to wait for 40 days for Advent or four weeks or whatever uh, the Advent length is. I always forget. Then I'm going to darn well celebrate my 12 full days of Christmas right up until Twelfth Night. And so this is a Christmas episode. It is also the last episode. I've been talking about this for a while, so it's probably not news to you that uh, we are closing out Young Heretics and that I am going over to Daily Wire Plus. You're going to be getting content from me there, which is on the same topics, um, hopefully richer and in even more depth and detail. Um, and I'm really looking forward to what we're going to do over there. Of course, of course, the time that I've spent with you on this show is deeply meaningful to me, will always be deeply meaningful to me. And so I didn't want to uh, just close out with the divine comedy, but wanted to take a little bit of time for one last hurrah, um, share a couple thoughts with you. We'll do uh, some Christmas themed young heretics classic, you know, uh, deep dive into into a text. And then we'll talk a little bit uh, about where this show has gone and where uh, we are going in, in the future. I think this is a really exciting moment and I'm uh, grateful to share it with you. But first, the last ever Christmas episode of Young Heretics, I wanted to bring to your attention a little story that you probably don't know about. One of the fun things for me on this show has been that sometimes I bring you something you definitely have heard of, like the Divine Comedy. You probably know about Dante, you probably know about the Inferno, or some, you know, if you've heard something about it. Uh, and then it's about understanding why this is a great work, how can we approach it, how can we maybe demystify it a little bit so that you don't feel uh, terrified to open its covers. Um, and then sometimes, you know, we go a little bit further afield, find something that's not quite so well known, and then I get to share something new with you. Um, and that's what I wanted to do today uh, before reflecting a little bit on the show and uh, the future. So the text, the book I want to read with you for Christmas is called The Haunted Man and the Ghost's Bargain. And I wonder if anybody out there, I'm sure there's some people out there listening to me who, who know about this, but it's probably not the majority. Um, it's by Charles Dickens, whom everybody knows about. Um, and everybody knows Dickens's first big Christmas hit, and that's A Christmas Carol. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the story of Scrooge, his redemption, the three spirits, so on and so forth. This is justly famous as, in some ways, the story that created the Christmas season as we now know it. It's commonplace to observe, and I, you know, don't disagree, that Dickens' experience of Christmas, the unseasonably cold early snow that happened in London during his youth, um, the sense, you know, the, the concern for the poor out of personal experience, the, uh, you know, attention, the, the delight in the warmth of the hearth and family, right, all of these things, and the way that Dickens managed to portray them, to bring them to life in uh, his novels, um, you know, th these these still stick with us in our heads when we think about, like, the imaginary standard ideal Christmas, right? It's like every Christmas movie you've ever seen, uh, National Lamp from National Lampoon to It's a Wonderful Life, all has kind of the vibe that Dickens uh, intuited and brought forth and, and uh, gave to us in these works. And so, you know, it, it, Christmas Carol, I'm not going to say anything against it on this episode. I watched the Alistair Sim version of the movie every year with my family, and I've done that since I was like old enough to understand it. And and my parents have done it since way before that, as, as have my as my oldest sister. Um, so, you know, that story will always hold a, a close place in my heart. But at this particular moment, um, I thought it might actually be good to know uh, that Dickens wrote other Christmas stories. Um, the success of A Christmas Carol inspired him to kind of keep going. And the last one he wrote, which is this this story, Haunted, The Haunted Man and the Ghost's 
Bargain, um, which came out in 1848. It took him a while to finish. His biographer kind of describes, his friend and biographer kind of describes how long it took him to, uh, you know, execute. Um, but it has, I think, something really valuable and beautiful to say specifically for our era. It's one of those kind of prophetic works that you think, oh, um, he saw something here, just like Dostoevsky saw something that was going to develop. And now we're dealing with the development. So this, this book feels so current still. Um, and, and he also, I think, in this later, more mature story, um, makes contact with something essential that was always there in his vision of Christmas and that indeed is always there in Christmas generally. Um, and that is the, the urgency, the importance of grief and of acknowledging grief uh, at, at Christmas. It, it, people often say, you know, oh, it's uh, the holiday season is really hard for people who have lost somebody. And that's very true because, of course, their absence is, is made more felt here. Um, but if you reflect on why that is and, and, and the meaning of it, I think you'll uncover with Dickens some, some more meaning depth to that than maybe even you had uh, you had known. And there is a certain consolation in this story for those of you out there who are, you know, feeling more poignantly than ever the loss of somebody you loved who is gone and um, for whom the, the holidays are a time not of just unbridled kind of childlike glee and delight, but of uh, sorrow, of longing. Um, Dickens loved Christmas more than anybody uh, he knew. He was famous for his actual, you know, in-person delight. He put put all his work away, which was very rare for him. He was a workaholic. He was constantly working on something except for the week of Christmas when he would just devote himself to playing with the kids and doing magic tricks. And it was, you know, known in his family and in his community that this was Dickens' time. Um, and yet he had a profound sense of of melancholy that came with the season. And that is what saves his Christmas vision from uh, the kind of maudlin, saccharine accusation that it's just sent mere sentimentalism. Um, and all great Christmas stories have this. They have somewhere, even if it's in the background, uh, a longing, a yearning, and a melancholy. So I wanted to maybe take some time with this story just to explore why that might be um, and to see how, what, what sort of consolation Dickens is offering. He's not just offering like unmixed sugar, unadulterated kind of pure delight of Christmas morning. He is offering that. But even in A Christmas Carol, of course, there's an enormous amount of loss and regret uh, in Scrooge's life, not all of which is resolved um, and none of which can be undone. It's not a story about unmaking the, the past and neither is The Haunted Man. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, so let me set this up for you a little bit. As you know, always, I try to uh, keep from spoiling stories too much. I am going to have to mention one uh, kind of spoilery thing here. Uh, but as uh, you know, it, it's not the worst, the end of the world, because it, always with Dickens, of course, the way it happens is kind of the point of, of the story. But the, uh, the premise here is you've got this guy, Redlaw is his name. And Redlaw is what Dickens calls a chemist. Um, and by that, he does not mean that he works at like a pharmacy, um, but actually that he has worked his way up from obscurity to become a noted chemistry professor. Um, and that's actually a really central, although uh, not always directly noted fact about him, uh, because what's going to happen is uh, Redlaw, we will meet Redlaw as a haunted man. We will meet him staying up late into the night, um, pondering his sorrows of the past, which torment him. He comes from humble beginnings, um, and there are betrayals in his past, uh, never uh, quite made specific, although always, you know, they gradually become clearer as the story goes on. Um, but they have to do with with loss, with unrequited love um, and with the betrayal of, of friendship. And he can't let go of this. He can't perform that act of uh, ephesus that we've been talking about on the show of, of, of release, of forgiveness, of, of, of finding peace. Um, and as he chews over these sorrows, which, you know, he's he's a very affable or even, you know, he's a, he's a beloved man in public, but in private, he has this grief that just tears him open um, and he can't get over it. And he's, he's visited by a ghost. It's really horrifying who looks like himself, like a kind of more wan and, uh, and uh, just sinister version of himself. And this is the ghost's bargain. He offers him a choice. You can continue on as you are, or um, if you let me, I will erase the memory of 
your sorrow. You will not remember anything about the bad things that have happened to you. You'll remember all the good things. There will be traces of recollection left in your mind. Um, but in the end, you know, you'll, they'll, those will vanish too. Um, so do you see how I say this is perfect? I mean, this is eternal sunshine of the spotless mind before that movie, long before that movie was made. There's a million sci-fi versions of it. Um, you can see it in Star Trek, you, you know, all sorts of, you know, versions of this story. Um, and what I, what I like about this kind of text, this, this, this way of approaching this question, um, and the, the many repetitions of this story is it's one of those things that you very rarely find a story that <laughs> somebody does this and everything goes fine. And uh, this is the same thing with like the metaverse and the matrix and the kind of virtual reality immersion stuff. It's like, this is something about which very few people write a story in which it's simply wonderful that this happens, right? Um, and erasing uh, bad memories is another one of those things where yeah, there's a few exceptions. Kubo and the Two Strings is a movie where this this kind of does have a happy ending. Um, but basically, um, it, it, picking out your, scrubbing your bad memories away, scrubbing your trauma, the past of your trauma away, um, never turns out well in, in stories. And I think that speaks to an instinct we have, which is going to grow increasingly important because you can now find, uh, many, many articles as I did, as I was doing research for this episode, um, in which people talk about scientists and psychiatrists talk seriously about not just, you know, giving people drugs to dull the pain of their suffering, but actually using electrical impulses or MRI or whatever to, to erase the storage of bad memories um, and therefore to supposedly erase the pain of the trauma. And what's interesting is like, you know, artistically, spiritually, we sense that this doesn't work, um, that this is a bad idea uh, and we have a certain revulsion at it, but we can't always say why. And I think Dickens kind of gives us the reason why. Let me read to you what uh, Redlaw says when he is teetering on the verge of making the decision to erase his bad memories. He says, a moment, I call heaven to witness, said the agitated man, that I have never been a hater of any kind. I thought that was a little funny that uh, now when we hear, I've, I've never, I ain't never been a hater, but that's not what he means. I've never been a hater of any kind. I've never hated anybody, never morose, indifferent, or hard to anything around me. If living here alone, I have made too much of all that was and might have been, and too little of what is, the evil I believe has fallen on me and not on others. But if there were poison in my body, should I not, possessed of antidotes and knowledge how to use them, use them? If there be poison in my mind, and through this fearful shadow I can cast it out, shall I not cast it out? And th this is a perfect, to me, this is a perfect paragraph. Um, and when people accuse Dickens of mere sentimentalism, as they sometimes do, I, I always say, you know, the, the endings of his stories are very sentimental in the sense that they, they evoke real sentiment. Um, but when you take them out of context and you just say, oh, look at this bright, cheery Christmas scene, um, you totally miss the point that the novella is a whole, the novel is a whole. And when you start at the beginning, you realize that actually there's a lot of, um, quite uh, searing and uh, carefully thought out and in some cases quite realist, um, you know, build up. There's a lot of a lot of build up in these stories that gets you to the place um, where you can be kind of cracked open and experience the sentiment of the of, of the finale. And this paragraph is a great example of this. Um, it's a very precise portrait of somebody, not a bad person. In fact, uh, it turns out a, a relatively, you know, good person who's made peace, uh, who hasn't made peace, but who has, you know, brought himself to some kind of, um, let's say stability in his life and, and success. Um, but who looks upon himself as a chemistry set. Uh, if I had poison in my blood and I had an antidote to the poison, then that material remedy would fix this material problem. Um, there's a poison in my mind. There's something in my brain that I need to cast out. Um, and even though it's, he's not like a pure materialist in the way that we now know of people who say like, I'm just electrical impulses. I'm just a chemistry set, whatever. Um, he's got that same attitude. He thinks that his mind is like his blood. Um, he thinks that his, uh, configuration of experiences is just like kind of a, you know, a loose concatenation that we can edit at will. Um, and, the analogy is doubly good because, of course, poison is actually very hard to draw out of the blood, right? Even in the physical world, um, things mix together in a way that's not totally um, uh, clear. It's, it becomes unclear. I mean, this is kind of, you know, the idea of entropy, right? That if you mix, say, jam into porridge, right? Um, unmixing the jam is is not an easily, uh, you know, it, it's not an easily reversible action. Um, similarly, sorrow in a human life, right, is not 
easily unmingled from joy. The things from the moment you suffer sorrow or hardship, from the moment something happens to you um, that brings you grief, um, it's not that that grief is is okay. It's not that it's good that you had that experience. Don't mistake me to be saying that. It's just that from then on, whatever redemption you may find, whatever peace you may seek, um, is going to be in the context of your having suffered that loss, that wrong. Um, and of course, against the backdrop of, of loss, many people find a kind of uh, triumph or a kind of redemption or a kind of peace um, that couldn't have been quite so rich, so full, so entire um, if they hadn't suffered the loss. Again, it's not to say, oh, it's so good that they that people die, that you lose people, that you, you go through these terrible um, times of, of deprivation and suffering. And it's just to say that if you do find a way to make peace with that, um, then the richness of that peace is deeper because the suffering was there. What you intended for evil, God has used for good, right, is the line that people typically cite here. It's from, um, you know, from uh, Joseph's uh, final kind of uh, meeting with his brothers who sold him into slavery. Um, in no way does the Bible mean to excuse in that moment the brothers who sold Joseph into slavery, right? That's not the point at all. It's simply to say there is evil in the world. We live in a world of evil. People do evil. Bad things happen. Um, and given the existence of that evil, we uh, find that God uses it for higher goods than we could ever have hoped or imagined. Um, in the psychological realm, right, what this means is that if you, there, that the, every experience of your life is a load bearing pillar. And if you try to pull out the ones that don't please you, um, if you try to simply erase them or to dull the pain of them with drugs or, or whatever, um, you will find that you haven't simply, you know, just set yourself free to a life of bliss. You'll find that you've dampened your connection to your humanity altogether. And that's what Redlaw finds. He gradually, as the memories of his, uh, of his past wrongs begin to slip away from him. Um, he becomes kind of insensate to everything around him. He can't appreciate music. He can't see the beauty of the stars. And why is that? It's because his uh, connection to humanity is bound up with his uh, sense of his own vulnerability, right? The loss that he's experienced. Um, it's it's almost as if our wounds, right, that, that we carry with us, and we all do, right? We all carry those wounds. Um, it's almost as if those wounds are entryways uh, for the suffering of others, if we will let it to come in, right? That it, when we experience loss, when we feel pain, um, then we find ourselves a member of the human family in some fundamental way, right? Um, and that is going to be the part that I, I do want to spoil just a little bit. Um, the, the story goes on for quite some time. There's um, another part of the bargain, which is that Redlaw, uh, when he draws near to somebody, erases their bad memories too. And so he thinks of, begins to think of this as a gift, begins to realize it's a curse. Everybody around him suffers terribly from it. And we start to see in these very touching and affecting ways, all the people that it hurts. Um, but at last, uh, what happens is that this whole thing comes to a head in a confrontation between Redlaw and this woman, Millie, who is uh, his cook. And so she's this very humble, but deeply beloved woman, um, quiet, right? And, um, and, and just one of those people who attracts everybody to her, especially children, right? Who's, whose warmth lights up a room, whatever cliche you want to apply to her, right? People just want to be around her. Um, and she, it turns out, is impervious to this curse and can actually undo it. And we don't know why until she finally reveals that quietly, um, for years and years, she has been carrying with her the loss of a child. Um, and it, it's a little unclear to me. I think it's a stillborn child, which is a very common thing in Dickens' day. Um, and this would have been something that Dickens' audience was well familiar with. Um, it's still something I think that is more prevalent than we talk about. Um, my sister, Faith Moore, did a really beautiful interview um, with my friend Helen Roy about my sister's experience with miscarriage. And they talked about, you know, we, we're not allowed really to, to air this grief um, because it makes it so clear that what we lose when we lose the unborn is, is a person, right? That an unborn person is a person and therefore losing that person is, is grief, is death. Um, and so I, I commend that to you as uh, just a reminder that this is still something people very much deal with. But especially, right, people deal with it, it dealt with it during uh, Dickens era, the infant mortality rate is much higher. Um, and and so this is a kind of a core sorrow that a lot of his readers would have been familiar with. Um, and, uh, and I think he puts into Millie's mouth, basically, the, you know, the, the, the answer to 
this whole puzzle of, well, why can't I just pull my uh, bad memories away? Why can't I just forget about them? Why do I have to travel through this valley of death to the promised country on the other side, right? Here's what Millie says. Our little dead child, uh, this is actually, excuse me, this is a conversation between Millie and her husband. So her husband says, our little dead child that you built such hopes upon and that never breathed the breath of life, it has made you quiet like Millie. I am very happy in the recollection of it, William dear, she answered. I think of it every day. And this is, I think this is a bold way of, for Dickens to describe this issue. Uh, I'm happy in the recollection of it. I mean, he is really um, making the claim that our sorrows are bound up with our happiness. And in a moment, I'm going to get to how I Dickens might have been in a position to, to say these sorts of things. Um, but let's keep going. When I think of all those hopes I built upon it, and the many times I sat and pictured to myself the little smiling face upon my bosom that never lay there and the sweet eyes turned up to mine that never opened to the light, said Millie. I can feel a greater tenderness, I think, for all the disappointed hopes in which there is no harm. When I see a beautiful child in its fond mother's arms, I love it all the better, thinking that my child might have been like that and might have made my heart as proud and happy all through life it seems by me, to tell me something. For poor neglected children, my little child pleads as if it were alive and had a voice I knew with which to speak to me. When I hear of youth in suffering or shame, I think that my child might have come to that, perhaps, and that God took it from me in his mercy, even in age and gray hair, such as father's is. Father's, it is present, saying that it too might have lived to be old long and long after you and I were gone, and to have needed the respect and love of other people. Children love me so that sometimes I have fancy. It's a silly fancy, William. They have some way I don't know of, of feeling for my little child and me, and understanding why their love is precious to me. If I have been quiet since, I have been more happy, William, in a hundred ways, not least happy, dear, in this, that even when my little child was born and dead but a few days, and I was weak and sorrowful, and could not help grieving a little, the thought arose that if I tried to lead a good life, I should meet in heaven a bright creature who would call me mother. It's an amazing passage. It's, of course, the kind of passage that you could imagine excerpting and saying, look how sentimental Dickens is. But of course, he earns the sentiment so profoundly by his engagement with this tragedy, with the loss of this child. And, you know, it, it has struck me throughout our time together, throughout this show, um, that there really are only these two answers, right? Um, the, people say, oh, well, you know, what, uh, what answer do you have to the problem of pain? You say there's a God. Well, how does he allow suffering? How can you, how can you believe in a God when, when there is suffering? And I, I've said before, I think I said it pretty early on, you know, <laughs> okay, I admit that that is a hard problem. But what's your answer to it, right? What's the materialist answer to it? What's the atheist answer to it? And nothing, right? It, it's basically to just say, well, we're going to, we're going to erase the suffering, right? We're going to stop the suffering from existing. Um, and it, it always ends up in these projects like this. Oh, erase your, your bad memories, right? Um, take, take it away and create heaven on earth, right? They'll only be good here and now or bring heaven down here to earth. Um, this is uh, Rakitin in Brothers Karamazov. It's any number of the characters we've visited with. Um, there's that answer, which, you know, you can try, go ahead, see how, see how utopia on earth works for you. And then there's this answer. There is the answer that somehow, somewhere in our suffering, God is with us, right? Um, and that is Christmas for Dickens. That's the meaning of the entire thing. And it's why his stories always come, why all of our Christmas stories that are, that are good ones always come with the melancholy. The very experience of Christmas is not just opening presents. It's the, the sadness that you know it'll be over too soon, right? That it's going to go away, that you can't have Christmas year round, um, that it comes back every year, but each time, you know, it leaves you. Um, and th this, this sense, this ritual observation um, of what we really are, which is pilgrims through a barren land, right? Um, <laughs> that is the point of Christmas. That's the point, in fact, of the incarnation, right? Which is made real in Christ's birth here, you know, as, <laughs> as every year when we recall that, you know, that unto us, a child is given. What is he given to do? To go to the cross, right? That is the whole point of the season. Um, and it's why Dickens's stories are, are so rich and so prescient, uh, even as we are now kind of being offered all 
all of these alternatives. There's, there's no alternative. There's no better answer to the problem of pain um, than this. And D Dickens would have known this by this time because in 1848, um, he had lost his beloved sister, Fanny. This is what I wanted to get to is this, um, you know, as he was finishing this, this novella, he had this uh, visitation with his sister who was dying of consumption. And this is what we call tuberculosis. They called it consumption because it wastes you away. You lose weight and so forth. And people, you know, would often die of it at this, at this time, a very common thing. But Fanny was, was 38. Um, and he visited her in July. She died not long after that. Um, and she was followed uh, into death by her son, who was uh, disabled, who was sickly, um, who inspired Tiny Tim and a number of the other um, crippled characters in Dickens's novels. Um, and so this was a, a terrible blow to him. He and Fanny were very close. She was the bright uh, talent of the family in, in, in youth. She, she was a musician. Her parents, their parents really devoted more attention and resources to her education than to his. Um, and, and they were, you know, profoundly bound up with one another. He loved her. He loved her so. Um, and, and again, in, in his, uh, his biographer records this, this letter that he wrote, um, about this in which he says, uh, her husband being young, she said, and her children infants, she could not help thinking sometimes that it would be very long in the course of nature before they were reunited. But she knew that was a mere human fancy and could have no reality after she was dead. Such an affecting exhibition of strength and tenderness in all that early decay is quite indescribable. I need not tell you how it moved me. I cannot look round upon the dear children here without some misgiving that this sad disease will not perish out of our blood with her. But I am sure I have no selfishness in the thought, and God knows how small the world looks to one who comes out of such a sick room on a bright summer day. It's an amazing uh, passage, and it, uh, that, that moment where she says that uh, it's a mere human fancy that my uh, husband is going to have to wait a long time to join me in heaven um, is very telling, right? This is somebody who believes that there is an eternity to which she is going that is outside of time in which uh, she and all those um, who are saved meet one another and are resurrected, right? Um, this is a, uh, an, a, you know, this is the vision of Christmas, uh, actual Christmas, right? Which makes a claim about the human person, what we're here for, where we're going, who goes with us, right? Um, actual Christmas, it is big enough to contain your grief. Um, no matter how deep your grief is, it's, it's, it's meant to be here with you. You are not, uh, if, if you're worried that you're like bringing the celebration down because you know, you're, you're mourning somebody. If you're worried that like, Oh, I, I should be celebrating Christmas, but what I'm really doing is being wrapped up in my grief, in my, in my sorrow, in my loss. Um, you know, be, be assuaged, be comforted, know that you're not like distracting from the season. You're not taking away from your enjoyment of, of Christmas. You are doing the season, right? Knowing that grief, bearing witness to the fact that we're not supposed to die, that we're not supposed to lose our loved ones, that someday we will be reunited. Um, and that even in some profound sense, we already are right. Um, that our memories of, of our loved ones connect us to a reality that is deeper even than our loss, which is that we already in eternity are together. Um, that's the point of Christmas. That's the whole thing. And so I wanted to read last and finally one, one, uh, passage from an essay called what Christmas is as we grow older. And this was something Dickens wrote much later, 1851. Um, and he's, he's begins to kind of outline and articulate this view. Um, and, and he says, you know, at, at Christmas, we invite everybody to our hearth, the young, the old, all, everybody that we love. Um, and even our, our disappointments, even the girl that we lost, like, you know, the way that Scrooge lost a girl, um, in his past, we invite that memory. Um, even the career disappointments that we have, we, we, we remember those and it's, it's, you know, we don't banish them from our thoughts. Um, and, and she, he begins to come up against this voice from the city of the dead and the city of the dead says, will you even keep me out? Will you even uh, allow those members of your company who have gone to death? Will you even invite them to your Christmas hearth? Um, pause, says a low voice. Will you keep nothing out? Think on Christmas day, we will shut out from our fireside. Nothing says Dickens. And then the voice replies, not the shadow of a vast city where the withered leaves are lying deep. The voice replies, not the shadow that darkens the whole globe, not the shadow of the city of the dead, not even that. 
of all days in the year, we will turn our faces toward that city upon Christmas Day, and from its silent hosts bring those we loved among us. City of the dead, in the blessed name wherein we are gathered together at this time, and in the presence that is here among us according to the promise, we will receive and not dismiss the, thy people who are dear to us. Yes, we can look upon these children angels that alight so solemnly, so beautifully among the living children by the fire, and can bear to think how they departed from us. Entertaining angels unawares, as the patriarchs did, the playful children are unconscious of their guests, but we can see them, can see a radiant arm around one favorite neck, as if there were a tempting of that child away. Among the celestial figures there is one, a poor misshapen boy on earth, of a glorious beauty now, of whom his dying mother said it grieved her much to leave him here, alone for so many years as it was likely would elapse before he came to her, being such a little child. But he went quickly, and was laid upon her breast, and in her hand she leads him. <laughs> Who's that That boy, right? And that mother, that's that's Fanny and her son, right? Um, so he's, he's, he's quietly making reference to his own loss, right? A, a poor misshapen boy on earth of a glorious beauty now, of whom his dying mother said it grieved her much to leave him here alone for so many years as it was likely would elapse before he came to her. But remember, that was a mere human fancy. He went quickly and was laid upon her breast, and in her hand she leads him. That's the Christmas message I want to give to you. Um, I, I, I want a Christmas that is capacious enough to hold grief and maintain the promise. And uh, ain't no Hallmark card, ain't no, you know, secularized Santa hat going to get you there. Um, only real Christmas, only the genuine article, the child born in Bethlehem, Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh, God who came to share our birth and our death, God who goes to the cross for us and gives us his resurrection. That's the Christmas that's going to be big enough to contain your grief and lead you into something richer and deeper beyond it. I hope this has been instructive, um, and I hope you have a very Merry Christmas in the true sense of the word, that is, a joyous Christmas, um, even if it is uh, mixed with all kinds of sorrow, as indeed all our joys must be here on this earth. Okay. Um, Having delivered that message, I would like to turn now to reflecting on this show, um, to expressing my gratitude to you for uh, being with me through it, and uh, to talking a little bit about the future, um, just so that those who don't know can know where to find me as, as time goes on, because this is not the end of our journey together by any means. Um, what I'm not doing is just quitting podcasting or whatever. Um, in fact, I'm going to do podcasting that I hope will um, bring you deeper into this, into these truths, um, bring you more of the richness of the Western tradition. Um, and I'm going to be doing that at Daily Wire Plus. Um, so the first thing to do if you want to uh, be with me on that journey is to go sign up for Daily Wire Plus if you haven't already. I think maybe some of my listeners are already Daily Wire Plus members, in which case, awesome, I will see you there. Um, and if not, then go uh, check it out. There's more than me over there. You'll get a ton of great content from Jordan Peterson and all the Daily Wire guys including some old dude that uh, may or may not be related to me, but definitely is not related to me. Um, and we will be doing stuff together over there. Um, it's going to be a really fun time, and I think it's uh, going to be meaningful. So I hope you will join us there. Um, but all that being said, right, everything new that is exciting comes with leaving something uh, behind. Nothing, as they say, lasts forever. And this is really true. You know, this show... Um, I had no idea what this show was going to be when I started doing it. I, um, I've said this before, but you know, I, I basically was like, you know, I started to get some Twitter followers and I, people were reading some of my work and people were saying, oh, you should have a podcast. You should have a podcast. You know, you're sort of, you, you like to talk, uh, and you have ideas and you should just have a show. Um, and I actually resisted that for a long time because I was sort of like, well, what, what am I going to do? a podcast about. Like, I feel like I already have friends who are expert at commenting on the news moment by moment. And I don't really feel like that's my calling. I don't think that's what I'm shaped for or best at doing. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, if, if I'm going to do a podcast, I'm just going to do like the nerdiest thing. I'm going to indulge my own kind of private 
interests, right? I, and I'm going to do the stuff that I love that maybe doesn't always fit into the news cycle, right? Because if you're a content creator, you know, um, if you do anything in media, you understand that like you're always looking for a news hook. You're always looking to grab attention. Um, the attention economy is very in, uh, intense. And so you're always trying to like, well, it's actually what Biden said yesterday is directly related to, to like blah, 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 the thing that I want to talk about. Um, and so I didn't want to do that. I was like, if I'm going to have a podcast, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to talk about the the good, the true, and the beautiful truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters. Right. That's why that was from the beginning. That was the slogan of, of, or the sign off of the show. Right. Um, and so I was like, well, that's okay. So I'll, you know, I, it won't be the biggest podcast in the world. It won't be, it won't take off. It'll just be, you know, things that I think matter and should be out there. And therefore I thought like five people would listen. Right. I was like, this will be for my mom basically. Um, and hi mom. She does listen. Um, in fact, she often like texts me after an episode that, that she likes. Um, so I was like, okay, well, I'll just, but I'll just hold this out. And the, the premise of it has always been, you know, we do a lot of talking about how to defend the canon, defend the classics. We must keep Homer in schools. Right. Um, and that's true. We must, right. There is in fact a movement to, uh, scrub our literary canon, uh, of all offenders to rewrite, uh, the entire curriculum to, um, you know, to accuse, uh, ludicrously these great books of, of being prejudiced or backward. Um, and that all needs refuting. And I will personally continue to refute it, uh, as will others. Um, but it occurred to me that we do so much fighting over this that we don't always actually crack the books that we're defending. We say, oh, we, you know, we must read Homer. And then we don't go away and actually read Homer because we've been so busy defending Homer, so, so to speak. Um, and so that was the point of the show. I just thought, I'm just going to see if anybody wants to actually read Homer with me. Um, and, and the greats, right? This has been, these have been the works that have enriched my life from, from as early as I could read, basically. Um, and I would like to see if anybody else. And it was like, what it was like was holding out a piece of food, like a morsel of food in your hand. And you wanted to see if anybody would come take it. Um, and in fact, you got like this big crowd that like devours your arm because they're so eager for more. Right. Um, and that was eye opening and joyous to me. And that's you, right? That's the letters that you send me, the emails, the, the DMs, whatever, where you're like, you know, I always give this example, but it really did stick with me. Like I'm listening to you on my tractor. I thought somebody is out there in America, in the United States of America, listening to me talk about Aristotle on his tractor. Like, and that's, you know, for all the challenges that our technology faces, that is an amazing thing to be doing in the 21st century. Or I'm a doctor, or I'm a teacher, or I'm homeschool, you know, homeschooling my kids, or I'm a mom, right? That's one that really gets me a lot. Or I'm a high school kid, you know, um, and you made me open these books. You made me interested in these things. You showed me they have something for me. Um, that's, all I want. <laughs> That's all I want to do. Um, and so I'm profoundly grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to do it. I hope you'll continue to give me the opportunity to do it. Um, I'm not going to stop. No, I'm not going anywhere except to the Daily Wire. Um, I'm not going to stop uh, offering this stuff because now I know, now I know that people are out there and they're hungry for it. Right. Um, and so I am, I'm not going to stop offering this stuff because I really do think that it's going to get more important, not less as our crises become more intense. Um, and, uh, I, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm just very, very grateful to you for proving that to me. I think I always say, you know, everybody can benefit from the classics. Um, you made that real for me. Um, and like I say, uh, come, come with me into the next part of this journey because it's going to rock. Um, in the meantime, as I'm building this new show over at Daily Wire, um, there are a few things you can do to keep in touch with me. And the main thing that I hope you will do uh, is pre-order my book, <laughs> How to Save the West. Uh, I know I've said this before. I'm going to keep saying it because I really do believe that if you like this show at all, um, you're going to love this book. Uh, I worked on it with you guys in mind, um, and it is maybe a little bit less uh, bombastic than you might expect from the title. I think that's personally, I think that's a virtue of it. Uh, what I am not offering is a grand political program that's going to fix everything once and for all. Um, if you're opening the book looking for that, you are going to be disappointed. But if you are opening the book looking for actionable wisdom that can help you navigate the choppy waters ahead, um, then I don't think you'll be disappointed. What I've tried to do in this book is to draw out of the well of Western tradition um, the strains of thought that I think can most meaningfully answer our present crises. The subtitle of the book is Ancient Wisdom for Five Modern Crises. Um, they are the crisis of reality, of, of truth, um, the crisis 
of the body with uh, transgenderism, but also transhumanism and um, our just general discomfort with our flesh, um, the crisis of meaning in art as well as in science, uh, the crisis of religion. Can we believe uh, in, in God? Is it outdated and outmoded to do so? And then finally, the crisis of the regime. How should we understand what's happening in America? Um, and why is everything going so crazy so quickly? Um, and, and at the end of each portion, I give a little bit of you know, insight or, or thought into you know, what you might do in your own life uh, to recover a bit of, of sanity on these questions. And so I, I would like to just uh, read to you briefly a portion of this book, uh, hopefully to tempt you to stave off the uh, clavenless interval between the end of Young Heretics and the beginning of the Daily Wire show by buying uh, or pre-ordering How to Save the West wherever you get your books. Um, let me just read to you something that I think is also uh, helpful for uh, us as we start to close out this show together. Okay, so here's this passage, um, and I'm going to read to you a few other passages, not not only from my book, uh, to uh, send you, send us on our way as this show comes to a close. Uh, this is from How to Save the West. Excellence is not something to be dreamed of out there, or to be hoped for from a utopia that will materialize if we make ourselves a little bit more miserable in the short term, or if we embark on yet another communist revolution of the kind that in practice, has always ended in nothing but immiseration, tyranny, and executions. Joy is not something to be manufactured with more drugs, nor virtue something to be play-acted on an imaginary landscape called the world stage. The best and realest things you will do will be done at home while playing with your kids, or at church, or at work, or at the town hall. You are not going to save the world. You are going, God willing, to seek virtue and love justice in the city where you find yourself. If digital technology has distracted us from all this, it has also given us tools that we do not need anyone's permission to use. Vast online libraries, new forms of currency, and innovative sources of income. There is only one thing powerful enough to make the difference between a drugged and docile future controlled by oligarchs and a future shaped by the agency of individual humans who are strengthened and not dominated by technology. That one thing is the human soul. Ancient and invisible though it is, it still exists. It is the realest thing about you, and you must hold on to what is truly real. Finally, brothers, wrote St. Paul in his letter to Europe's first Christian church in the Macedonian city of Philippi, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is sacred, whatever merits love or admiration, if anything is excellent or laudable, devote your attention to these things. Whatever you have learned or received, or heard or seen in me, put it into practice. Goodness, truth, and beauty are, in the last analysis, things which you can know and grasp in your immediate surroundings. To defend the West itself, we must be the West. We have to live it in our everyday lives. You are a thing fearfully and wonderfully made for the glory of God, and you can live like it. I cannot promise you that your life will be happy, but I can promise that wherever you are, However well or badly things are going right now, your life has meaning. I can promise that truth, beauty, and goodness are not figments of your imagination or accidents of your biology, that they exist, and that you are a creature designed to seek them. Nothing is more real than that. Uh, if that sounds like a book you might like to read, please do check it out. It's on Amazon. It's at Barnes & Noble. It's uh, on my publisher's website at Regnery. Uh, wherever you get your books, do go check it out, please. Um, and so let me just stay on this theme a little bit, the theme of being the West. Um, I want to read to you another passage, and this is not by me, but by Harry Jaffa. Um, if you don't know Harry Jaffa, then you need to read my friend's book, uh, Glenn Elmer's The Soul of Politics. Uh, but Jaffa was the kind of second generation of the Straussian lineage that leads to Claremont. So Leo Strauss, um, a great political philosopher of the 20th century, um, Harry Jaffa, who kind of carries Strauss's ideas forward in many ways and is, uh, you know, a profound influence and indeed teacher for many of the people that found the Claremont Institute where I work. Um, and so here is uh, what he writes in his book, Conservatism and the American Founding. This is 1984. Um, and I, I really, uh, I think this expresses well the project that I'm attempting to do with this show and with this book as well. Um, I believe, writes Jaffa, that the enterprise of Western civilization is consummated each time a soul is saved from the dark night of fanatical obscurantism. 
It is consummated whenever one soul is released from the pessimism that truth is unobtainable or not worth the trouble to obtain. It is consummated whenever a single soul is disabused of the proposition that the subjective intensity of one's convictions matters more than their objective validity. Eternity is indeed the theme of philosophy, but it becomes such when the individual soul becomes aware of its power to know, and when it discovers in this power the immortal ground of its mortal existence. This, above all else, is what is meant by saving Western civilization and reversing the decline of the West. Whether there will be enough of such souls, or whether the influence of such souls will be sufficient to inform political action on a sufficient scale, is something no one can foretell. But unless we surrender to pessimistic determinism, a pessimism born of the denial of the possibility of philosophy, unless we surrender to the nihilistic doctrine that there is no objective difference between doctrines except the subjective intensity with which they are held, we have no reason to believe that we must fail. If we do not know that we must fail, we have a duty to persevere in our political efforts to reverse the decline of the West. It's a very beautiful passage. Um, it expresses well what I hope you will take away uh, from the book and, and indeed from this show. You know, one thing I've always said about this show is that it's the classical education you didn't know you were missing um, or you didn't know you'd been denied. And one thing that I learned, as I mentioned, is that, uh, you know, this I, I didn't know how deeply people were missing it. Um, and, and now I do. And that's uh, I, I'm profoundly grateful for that. And I'm, I feel inspired by it to keep doing this stuff um, and not because I think it's definitely all going to turn out OK, not because I think that, you know, we're definitely going to get the right presidential candidate in 2024, um, but because this is our task. And unless we are simply devoted to despair, in which case, what's the point? Um, then the whole project is simply about the reinvigoration of soul after soul, the rescue of soul after soul from pessimism uh, saved from the dark night of fanatical obscurantism as as Jaffa says, this is something you can do in your own life, in your own reading, it's something you can do in your family, and it is something you can do in your community. That is the point of it all. Um, and, you know, when I say it's this, this show is the classical education you you didn't know you were missing, um, I look back with with gratitude and uh, some amount of, of pride that I think, you know, the, the library of this show, if you listen to it all the way through, if you went and uh, did a little bit of reading to supplement the stuff we talk about, um, it would be a pretty good, you know, two plus year course in uh, some of the great works, a kind of orientation, a lay of the land. Um, that's the point, right, is not to have read everything, um, but to gradually build in your mind the map of history and tradition so that you know you are somewhere uh, and that you are not just, it's not just book after book, it's not just thing after thing, um, but there are, there's a shape and a form uh, to the history of this great enterprise we call the West. Um, and so to close out, I'd actually like to read something not by me or by Harry Jaffa, um, but by somebody on Locals um, who wrote uh, once I announced the end, end of the show, um, something that really touched me. And a lot of you guys have, have said things about the show and your relationship to it that, that moved me deeply. Um, but this from, from Lance, uh, I, I really love. Um, he writes, Spencer, there are so many episodes and teachings that I am grateful for. But I think the greatest thing you imparted to me in words or substance is be of good cheer. No matter how bleak things may be, in the end, right, even if it seems utterly extinguished, will flicker alive and blaze in triumph. We may not survive to witness the victory, but we can pass in the sure knowledge that ultimately things will come aright. This buoys me up from despair and gives me the strength to fight on. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for everything, for the tweets, for the sharing, for the funny questions, for the memes, uh, for doing weird things with Photoshop to my face, for uh, for writing, for sharing your struggles, uh, for letting me know that you had let me into your life, into your home, um, into your family. Uh, I, I'm 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 more grateful for that than I can say. And I look forward uh, to more of it to come. Uh, please do join me at Daily Wire Plus as I take this thing forward. Um, that's it for me. And we will keep striving for truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters. <laughs>